Psalm 109 is a prophecy of vengeance against hateful enemies. It is one of what is known as the imprecatory psalms. And imprecatory just means psalms of cursing, psalms of condemnation. There are a few psalms in the collection of the 150 psalms that are really strong prayers against one's enemies and prayers that God would hurt and destroy them in very strong ways. Now, Psalm 109 is titled to the chief musician, a Psalm of David. Some people think that the chief musician was the choir master for King David and subsequent kings of Israel. Other thinks that the title chief musician is actually a poetic reference to God himself. I mean, after all, God is the author of music, so it would be fair to call him the chief musician. Now, again, this is a Psalm of David, and it is thought to be of, as I mentioned before, the imprecatory Psalms, perhaps the strongest of these imprecatory Psalms. David's songs, or the songs of others in the collection of the Psalms, that call down curses upon their enemies. Again, it's important to remember that these are prayers. They are actually committing vengeance unto God. And we would say, with the greater revelation of grace and truth that came by Jesus Christ, we understand that we are to pray for the good of our enemies and not for their ruin. But nevertheless, David did this and he committed it unto God. We also remind ourselves that David refused to act upon these curses. He left the actual vengeance up to God. And this is especially relevant regarding David, who knew what it was like to take life with the sword. When David withheld taking vengeance, it was because he chose to, uh, not because he lacked the opportunity or the skill or the courage. So let's take a look at this very intense Psalm 109, uh, these verses that speak to us about David's desire to see destruction come upon his enemies. Here we go, starting with the first three verses, Psalm 109. Do not keep silent, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. Here at the opening of Psalm 109, David is once again in trouble, beset by many enemies. So he cries out to God and he says, Do not keep silent, O God of my praise. And the nature of the trouble that he was in is revealed at least in part in verse 2 where he says, the mouth of the wicked spoke against him. And therefore he's praying that God would not be silent. If the mouth of the wicked is going to speak, David says, Lord, I don't want them to have the last word. I want you to speak. And then in verse 3, he insists his innocence in this matter, at least his relative innocence. He says in verse 3, that they fought against me without a cause. David was confident in his own innocence in reference to his enemies. In other words, David isn't here pretending to be sinlessly perfect, but in the dispute between him and his enemies, relatively speaking, David was innocent and his enemies were guilty. You see, their harsh words against him were spoken, as verse 2 says, with a lying tongue. And as verse 3 says, their words of hatred were given without a cause. By the way, is that not one of the worst weapons that Satan uses against me? The deceitful lies that other people will tell about us. The things they'll say about us, the things they'll say behind our backs. David knew the sting of this kind of opposition from his enemies. So, He's going to continue his prayer here in verses 4 and 5, where he says this, In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Notice this. David says, regarding his enemies, 
in return for my love, they are my accusers. You see, in the previous lines, David insisted that the hatred of his enemies against him was without cause. And here he further explains that he actually extended love to these adversaries. But instead, they gave to David, as verse 5 says, evil for good and hatred for the love that he showed towards them. Notice this too in verse 4 where it says, In return for my love, they are my accusers. That word accusers in verse 4 is the same basic Hebrew word that we also translate Satan, the accuser. I like what John Trapp had to say about this. He said, in the Hebrew, they satanically hate me. To render evil for evil is brutish, but to render evil for good is devilish. Now, in contrast to that, David says, even though his enemies were returning uh, evil for him in return for the love that he showed to them, David's response, verse 4, was, but I give myself to prayer. David's response was proper, even using a New Testament understanding. Now, the following lines of Psalm 109 are filled with the bitter wishes that form something of a prophecy of doom against these enemies. I want you to notice this. David said these words in prayer to God. David actually did nothing to bring this doom against his enemies. David understood that was God's work. It wasn't his work. As for David, he would simply give himself to prayer and leave it with the Lord. And again, I want to emphasize, when we read these imprecatory psalms, that is the essential thing for us to remember. They are prayers committing this vengeance to the Lord and refusing to take the vengeance in one's own hands. Now, according to James Montgomery Boyce, the phrasing of verse 4 in the original Hebrew, where we read in the New King James translation, but I give myself to prayer, Boyce said this, the Hebrew is more abrupt and therefore even stronger. It says literally, but I prayer. That is, I am all prayer or characterized by prayer. While my enemies are uttering false words about me to other people, trying to do me harm, I am speaking to God. I like that observation from James Montgomery Boyce. It really gives a sense that David says, my enemies are speaking evilly. I am speaking to God and pouring out my heart in prayer. You see, it's as if his enemies became hatred personified. David became prayer and acted according to a spirit of prayer, even if his prayer was a prayer of doom upon his enemies. That's where we come up to verse 6, and I'm going to read now all the way through verse 13 and see David pray for destruction upon the family of his enemies. Here we go. Verse 6 says, Set a wicked man over him. Now, I need to pause right here. When you take a look at that first line of verse 6, David is speaking now of his enemy in the singular. And we don't know exactly why this is, because in the previous verses, he was speaking of his enemies in the plural. Perhaps David is gathering together all of his enemies and personifying them into one person, sort of in a poetic device. Or it very well could be that David is referring to whoever the leader or the captain of his enemies were. Either way, we just notice that now he's sort of personifying his enemies as to being one person. That's why, and I'll begin at verse 6 again. Set a wicked man over him, and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days become few, and another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Let the creditor seize all that he has, and let strangers plunder his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him, nor let there be any favor to his fatherless children. 
let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Again, it's a remarkable thing what David begins here in verses 6 through 13. This is a blistering prayer asking God to curse his enemies, or the enemy is personified as one person. Now, there are some people who think that the curses that are found in verses 6 through 20 describe the lying words that David's enemies spoke against him, and that he's using the singular here to speak of himself, uh, as well as later on in verse 20. For example, G. Campbell Morgan had this opinion of this section of Psalm 109. I have to say, I've examined this argument that really what David is doing in these verses is voicing what his enemies said about him, but I, I can't really sign on for that. The main argument against this approach is how Peter, in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, quoted verse 8 of Psalm 109 in this very section, and he applied the verse to an evil man who was rightly condemned, that is, to Judas. And he did not apply the situation to an innocent man who was wrongly condemned. Now, again, I want to say that it's fair to note that the tone of these curses are generally in the term of the prophetic rather than in the immediate curse. David is predicting the righteous judgment to come rather than pronouncing it. Although, let's not sugarcoat this, David certainly wished for this judgment to come upon his enemies. But I do want you to remember one other thing before we go on to verse 6. He says, I just want to remind you that there were notable times in David's life when he could have taken vengeance, but he did not. This was true twice in regard to the mad and murderous King Saul who hunted David for many, many years. It was also true in regard to Mephibosheth, to Absalom, to Shimei. All of these people were men against whom David could have taken vengeance, and at least by the standards of that day, had the right to take vengeance, yet he did not. Instead, he committed his vengeance to God in prayer. But when David prayed for, ven prayed for vengeance, he let it all hang out. He didn't hold anything back. So he says in verse 6, let an accuser stand at his right hand. The curse David had in mind was to have an accuser or adversary standing in the place of someone who should give aid and help. You see, this means that the guilty one would be left without any help, and instead he would have Satan at his right hand. And right here, I'm just considering that the Hebrew word for accuser is actually Satan. Let Satan be at his right hand instead of somebody to help him. And he says in verse 7, when he is judged, let him be found guilty. David thought of every possible calamity that could come upon his enemy, and he prayed for it to happen. You see, he prayed that in the court of law, his enemy would be found guilty. And when he prayed that the prayer itself would become sin, he prayed that the life of his enemy would be short, let his days be short, as in verse 8, and that another would occupy his office. Now, I want you to look at that phrase in verse 8. Let another take his office. That phrase in Psalm 109, verse 8, was used by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the mouth of Peter to determine that the apostles gathered together in the upper room after Jesus ascended to heaven, you'll find this in Acts chapter 1, that they should replace Judas in their apostolic number. Again, the reference is in Acts chapter 1 verse 20. You see, the hateful enemy described by David was certainly a preview of Judas, who fought against Jesus without any cause whatsoever and rewarded the good that Jesus did to him with evil, as is described in verse 5. 
But he continues on the curses. Did you see what David said in verse 9? Let his children be fatherless. David prophesied that the doom to come upon this hateful enemy would extend even to his family. His short life would mean that his children would be orphaned and that his wife would be left a widow. And his orphan children would suffer great poverty themselves. They would have cursed lives. Verse 13 says, in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Now, in verses 14 through 20, we consider David's prayer of destruction against his enemy. He says here, starting at verse 14, Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be continually before the Lord, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because he did not remember to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come to him. As he did not delight in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, as with his garment, so let it enter his body like water and like oil into his bones. Let it be to him like the garment which covers him and for a belt which he girds himself continually. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers and to those who speak evil against my person. Again, wow, we're just struck with this section, verses 14 through 20, and the intensity of David's uh, anger against his enemies and how he pours it out before God in prayer. In that prayer, he says, verse 14, let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. David hoped that the sins of his enemy's ancestors would also be held against his enemy and that the remembrance of those sins would be continually, as it says in verse 15, before the Lord. Now, why? Well, David is going to pile reason upon reason. Here's one reason that he gives in verse 16, because he did not remember to show mercy. You see, this enemy and his companions despised the goodness that David extended to them. Do you remember verse 5 where David said that he extended love to them, but they answered with hatred? Yet the hateful ways went beyond the wrong that was done to David. He also, verse 16, persecuted the poor and needy. Although some people think, such as Matthew Poole, that the poor and needy man described in verse 16 who's persecuted was David himself, and I suppose it could be. Even in verse 16, it says that he might even slay the broken in heart. This merciless cruelty to the broken in heart was completely contrary to the nature of God. You see, Psalm 34, 18 says that the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. And Psalm 51, 17 tells us that God never despises a broken heart. David continues here in verse 17, and he says, As he loved cursing, so let it come to him. You see, David's prayer was rooted in simple justice. Lord, my enemy loved cursing, so let curses come to him. David wanted God to do to this enemy what that guilty man had done to others. David wanted the man to be clothed with curses. And again, this is simply giving the man what he wanted for others. Charles Spurgeon said this regarding this point. He said, quote, retaliation, not for private revenge, but as a measure of public justice is demanded by the psalmist and deserved by the crime. Surely the malicious man cannot complain if he is judged by his own rule and has his grain measured with his own bushel. Well, that's just it, isn't it? As Jesus said himself, As you've shown mercy to others, God will show mercy to you with the same measure. And as this man loved cursing, so let the curses come to him. 
Verse 20 says, let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers. You see, this emphasizes that this is a prayer from David. As David previously said in verse 4, he would pray and leave the matter to the Lord. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers, not my own reward unto them. David wished for this doom. David prophesied this doom. But at the same time, he understood that it would be God's job to perform it. Now, in verse 21, we see David continuing on in a plea for help. You know, he's kind of done, at least for the moment, at verse 20, with asking God to rain down curses, deserved curses, upon uh, his enemies. Now he's going to cry out for the help that he needs. Look at this, starting at verse 21, where we read this. But you, O God the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake. Because your mercy is good, deliver me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. I am gone like a shadow when it lengthens. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh is feeble from lack of fatness. I also have become a reproach to them. When they look at me, they shake their heads. Do you notice this? In verse 21, David makes an impassioned plea to God, not for the destruction of his enemies. He's already dealt with that. But now for God's mercy to be extended to him, he says in verse 21, deal with me for your name's sake. You see, David understood that it wasn't enough to have his enemy judged. David needed help from God. He needed help from Yahweh Adonai. So David asked for it on the basis of God's name and mercy. He didn't ask for it on the basis of his own righteousness. And then he lays out how badly he needs this help. Verse 22 says, My heart is wounded within me. David says in verse 22 that he was poor and needy. You could say that he was the one broken in heart mentioned previously in verse 16. And then in this very powerful poetic phrase, look at it here in verse 23. He says, I am gone like a shadow when it lengthens. David's misery was also physical. He felt like his life was wasting away. He complained that his flesh was feeble from lack of fatness. That's in verse 24. You see, the hateful enemy either caused this physical weakness in David or perhaps he just took advantage of it. But the end result is what we find in verse 25. David says of all his companions around him, when they look at me, they shake their heads. People looked at David in his sorry condition and they despised him. That's what it means in verse 25 when it says he became a reproach. It means they, they despised him. They, they couldn't bear to look at him. They shook their heads at David in a combination of pity and disgust. So now David cries out for help. I love this. It's beautiful in verses 26 through 29. Help me, O Lord my God. O save me according to your mercy, that they may know that this is your hand, that you, Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you bless when they arise, let them be ashamed, but let your servant rejoice. Let my accusers be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own disgrace as with a mantle. Don't you love that great prayer that begins verse 26? Help me! Now David expanded upon that. He said, help me, O Lord my God. But listen, those two words can be greatly used by God when we pray unto him with those words, help me. And David says, help me, O Lord, my God, in verse 26. David's plea was straightforward. It was simple. Like the woman of Canaan with the demon-possessed daughter, you'll find it in Matthew chapter 15, he asked God for help. And as in verse 21, he asked for it on the basis of God's mercy. Did you see that line? 
Save me according to your mercy, not according to his own merit or deserving. Why? Verse 27, that the Lord would be glorified that, again, I'm going to read you a line from verse 27, that they may know that this is your hand. You see, it was very important to David that his enemies and everybody who looked on understood that this rescue was from God's hand, that the Lord had done it. David didn't want deliverance only for his own sake, but also for the glory of God. You see, that's what he wanted to proclaim. He wanted something so wonderful, so glorious, so merciful from God that people would look at it and say, this was the hand of God. You know, I can't resist reading another quote from Charles Spurgeon here. He said this, ungodly men will not see God's hand in anything if they can help it. And when they see good men delivered into their power become more confirmed than ever in their atheism. But in all good time, God will arise and so effectually punish their malice and rescue the object of their spite that they will be compelled to say like the Egyptian magicians, this is the finger of God. Isn't that what we want? We say unto God, Lord, help me, deliver me, but do it with such a wonderful hand. Do it with your mighty right hand so that everybody would see that it was your deliverance and so that you are glorified. Then I have to say, I really love what David said in verse 28. Did you see that? Let them curse, but you bless. David understood that the curses of his enemies could never triumph over the blessings of God in his life. And this would make David rejoice. And his enemies, look at verse 29, be clothed with shame, wearing their disgrace as if it were a mantle. That's sort of a overcoat or a poncho overcovering somebody's shoulders and back. Now, starting at verses 30 and 31, ending this psalm, David is going to express his confident praise in God. You'll love how Psalm 109 ends. Look at this. He says, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude. For he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. It's beautiful. In verse 30, David is now at a higher place. He's no longer concerned or greatly troubled by his enemies. Instead, he says, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. David's heart was to see God honored in this deliverance. So he would praise God vocally and publicly among the multitude. I'll greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. That's vocal praise. And public praise means among the multitude, as it's mentioned there in verse 30. And again, it's beautiful to consider the strength of these closing lines of the psalm when you compare them with the beginning of the psalm. Alexander McLaren, that great Scottish preacher who preached so many years in London, uh, said this in this regard. He said, the psalm began with addressing the God of my praise. It ends with the confidence and the vow that the singer will yet praise him. It painted an adversary standing at the right hand of the wicked to condemn him. It ends with the assurance that Jehovah stands at the right hand of his afflicted servant as an advocate to protect him. That's what we see there in verse 31. He shall stand at the right hand of the poor. You see, God is to be praised for his love and his care for the poor and needy, for those oppressed by such hateful enemies who condemn the righteous. And again, it's a beautiful thing. Instead of the accuser who stood at the right hand of the victim earlier in the psalm, now we have the Lord standing at the right hand of the poor. How much better it is to be confident that the Lord stands at your right hand, no matter what accuser or enemy may be set against you. Now, before we finish Psalm 109, let's consider at least three ways that this psalm points to Jesus. 
Again, I know that if we took the time, we could consider many, many other ways. And we do remember the beautiful fulfillment of verse 8, let another take his office in Acts chapter 1, verse 20. But specifically of how Psalm 109 points to Jesus, let me suggest three ways. Number one, Jesus gives us the contrast to the imprecatory prayers of the Psalms. You know, those get them God prayers. In contrast to the imprecatory Psalms, Jesus prayed at the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Look, if anybody had the right to call down prayers of curses upon its enemies, it would have been Jesus at the cross, but he didn't. He showed an even greater and higher way of love for one's enemies. Now, please understand, this doesn't make the prayer of David in Psalm 109 wicked. It doesn't make David's prayer in this psalm invalid, but it does show us how much greater Jesus is than even a great man of God like David, the king of Israel. That's number one. Jesus is the contrast to the imprecatory prayers of the Psalms. But number two, Jesus knew what it was like to be attacked and to have enemies. The words of verse two were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let me read to you those words from verse two. The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. Hey, those words could be regarded as a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And when we are lied about, when we are spoken against, we have a sympathetic Savior who knows exactly what we have gone through and who endured it with God the Father strengthening him. So that's number two. Jesus knew what it was like to be attacked and to have enemies. And then number three, Jesus is the one who stands at the right hand of the poor. Did you remember that line in verse 30 at the very end of the psalm? You see, Jesus is our advocate, as 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says. He is our defense attorney who stands beside us, defending us against every attack and accusation. No, those words that Yahweh will stand at the right hand of the poor, those are perfectly fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah, who is our advocate, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He is the one who stands at our right hand, defending us, protecting us. So friends, what a beautiful psalm, even in the midst of, I'll admit it, some ugliness in the psalm. There was some ugliness when David was calling upon God to rain down curses upon his enemies. Yet nevertheless, we see the beauty in the fact that David committed this to the Lord in prayer and that the beauty of this psalm is fulfilled in the beautiful person and work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray that these things would be real in our lives. Lord, just as David committed vengeance unto you, so we want to do the same thing. So Lord, for anybody who sets themselves against us in an ungodly way, Lord, we commit them to you. And we ask that you would give us prayers of generosity and love towards them. And that, Father, that you would give us the spirit of Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior, who stands at our right hand to protect us in the midst of of every attack and storm. We thank you and praise you for this in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.